Hey everyone, you're watching We Had That, and today I'm going to talk about the 1985 Wave 4 G.I. Joe Footloose action figure. G.I. Joe was one of my favorite toy lines as a kid. Beginning with their initial release in 1982, they were immediately my go-to action figures for the next several years. I also loved the Marvel G.I. Joe comic book series, and the arrival of the Dreadnoughts was easily one of my favorite storylines in the G.I. Joe universe. I was probably at the height of being into G.I. Joe in 1985, when the fourth wave started to creep into the stores. I still remember how excited I was to see Footloose, the first figure I found from Wave 4. On the back of his package, I got my first preview of what other figures would be coming out, and I was absolutely thrilled to see that the Dreadnoughts, Torch, Ripper, and Buzzer were pictured right next to Footloose on the card back. Not only that, but there were several other amazing-looking new characters coming soon, too. As a big fan of snow-themed action figures, the Cobra Polar Assault Troopers, who I would later learn were called Snow Serpents, immediately caught my eye. But as cool as it was to see the other characters who were coming out, Footloose himself was very much what I wanted from a G.I. Joe figure. He was an infantry trooper, and unlike so many G.I. Joes over the years, he actually looked like a soldier. He wore woodland BDU, or battle dress, uniform, which meant a camouflage shirt and camouflage pants with a standard Alice suspender rig consisting of a web belt and suspenders that had a knife on one side and a grenade and a pouch on the other, and he wore a pair of standard green canvas jungle boots. His accessories were also very much what I would have expected from a U.S. Army soldier at the time. He carried an M16A1 rifle, which had been a standard issue for the Army since the late 60s. He also came with a black M72 law, which stands for Light Anti-Tank Weapon. This weapon was the easier-to-use 1960s replacement for the bazooka. He had a K-Pot helmet with a camouflage helmet cover, and it was particularly cool that Hasbro not only molded leaves onto the helmet, but also took the extra step of painting them brown. So unlike most of the removable G.I. Joe helmets at the time, this one was actually two colors. Last, he had a tan backpack with a molded-on canteen and a couple of grenades. As an added bonus, I liked the fact that with the straps on the M16 and the M72, you could attach everything so that he could walk around with all of his gear without having to carry anything in his hands. Of every figure that Hasbro released in the G.I. Joe line, I felt like Footloose was probably the most accurate representation of what an actual soldier would have looked like at the time. According to his file card, Footloose's name was Andrew D. Myers. He was the captain of his track team and an Eagle Scout from Gary, Indiana. He had been working on a phys ed degree when he dropped out of college and moved to the West Coast to find himself. While in California, it suddenly hit him that he should join the Army. I think this may be one of the most realistic file cards written for any of the G.I. Joes, and part of the reason that I like this figure is that he exemplified what I wanted from a G.I. Joe character in terms of being a realistic soldier. Unfortunately, that seems to mean that he wasn't used very much in the comics. Footloose only appeared in four or five issues of the original main run of G.I. Joe, and most of those appearances were just a panel or two where he was really not the main focus. Interestingly, he was on the cover of issue number 37, without his mustache, in July of 1985 for his first appearance, and his most significant storyline. In this issue, Footloose shows up at Fort Wadsworth with all his gear and meets Wild Bill, who after checking his orders, refers to Footloose as the new bullet stopper. He's immediately told to jump into the helicopter with Wild Bill as they head off to Footloose's first mission. The pair arrive at a carnival where Footloose is ordered to man the Armadillo Mini Tank, which was a new vehicle at the time, and ends up in a shootout with Tomax. Footloose seems confused and unsure what he's supposed to be doing in pretty much the entire issue. Actually, he seems confused in his brief appearance in issue number 38 as well. 
For some reason, he's colored in desert camo in issue number 90, which was his last appearance in the original run. Footloose also appeared in issue number 8 of the G.I. Joe Special Missions comic. Although he was in this issue for more than most of the other issues that he was in, Lowlight was really the main character of this story, and Footloose was more of a background character. It's also interesting that he, again, was colored in a tan camo uniform rather than the green camo uniform from the action figure. Footloose did fare better in the cartoon than in the comic book, but even though he made about a couple dozen appearances in the Sunbow G.I. Joe cartoon, most of them were very brief and had no dialogue. There were about half a dozen episodes where he did appear on screen for about a minute or so, but even then, he didn't have much to say. For example, in the episode The Viper is Coming, he's around for most of the adventures, though not always on screen, and he says very little. However, this episode stood out to me because not only did he have his backpack, which is a small detail that I appreciate, but he's even shown with his M16 rather than the laser rifles that you typically expect to see used by the Joes in each episode of the cartoon. Well, the M16 was shooting lasers, but at least it looked like the gun that came with the figure. Footloose had a relatively large appearance in the episode Worlds Without Ends Part 1, and also in part two a little bit as well. In this pair of episodes, a small team of Joes was hit by an explosion from an experimental weapon called the Transmuter, which accidentally sent them to an alternate dimension where Cobra had taken over the world and the surviving Joes are in hiding. There's some pretty cool images and concepts from this episode that you might not expect from an episode of a kid's show like G.I. Joe. For example, we see skeletons of dead members of the G.I. Joe team, which seems kind of heavy. Footloose certainly isn't the star of the show here, but he does have more screen time and dialogue than he usually does in most episodes, particularly when he's driving an Striker, and then later, briefly, when he's flying one of the Skyhawks. It's a pretty interesting episode that includes one more thing you don't see very much in the G.I. Joe cartoon, several members of the team leaving the show. At the end of the episode, Grunt, Steeler, and Clutch stay behind in the alternate dimension to fight for the resistance against Cobra. Footloose's most significant appearance in the G.I. Joe cartoon was in the episode Hearts and Cannons, in which he and Dusty jump out of a cargo plane to lighten the load enough for the plane to reach its destination, and the pair end up in the desert where Cobra is testing a new weapon. He and Dusty see that a scientist has been kidnapped by Cobra and forced to build this weapon, so the pair rescue her from Cobra. For some reason, in this episode, Footloose talks like a hippie California surfer who's really high rather than a soldier who grew up in Indiana. I have no idea why they decided to overhaul him for this episode, but I don't think it really fit the character very well. Footloose also appeared in one of G.I. Joe's famous public service announcements. In this one, a group of kids are playing football when one of them gets a nosebleed. Footloose shows up with his backpack nice and tells the kids the correct way to deal with nosebleeds. Although I suspect it was an accident, that actually does tie in well with his history of being an Eagle Scout and working on his physical education degree. I'm not sure what he was doing in the area that would require him to be there with all his gear, including two hand grenades, but still, this was one of the PSAs that made the most sense to me. Thankfully, for the sake of the PSA, he didn't sound like a stone surfer in this appearance, even though that would have been hilarious. After the Sunbow run of G.I. Joe ended, there was a second cartoon series produced starting in 1989 that seemed targeted at a younger audience. Although most of the characters for the overall series were new, there were a lot of familiar faces in the five-part movie that launched the show. Familiar faces, but not familiar uniforms. Hasbro had just released repainted versions of old figures as part of Slaughter's Marauders, a team of Joes who followed Sergeant Slaughter released as part of Wave 8. Since I was a big fan of the look for the original figure, I thought the Slaughter's Marauders version of Footloose was a big step backwards for the character. But it was cool that he was at least included in the cartoon a little bit as kind of a background character. I'm not sure why, but I don't think Hasbro used Footloose on any of the vehicle packaging art. 
There's a small photo of Footloose along with a bunch of other Joes on the back of the box for the 1986 Havoc, but that's about the only time I can think of him being on any of the vehicle or accessory boxes at all. Regardless of his limited use in packaging art, the cartoons, and the comic books, Footloose has always seemed like a great addition to the Joe team to me. He definitely saw a lot of action in my G.I. Joe adventures, and I would have liked it if there had been even more figures like him that fit my idea of what soldiers should have looked like around that time. What do you think of Footloose? Did you have a Footloose action figure as a kid? Did he serve on the front line of your Joe team, or was he constantly searching for his place in your squad? Tell me in the comments below. Also, please give this video a thumbs up and share it on social media. If you enjoy my content, please subscribe to my channel and hit that notifications bell so you'll be notified when I post new videos. And one last thing, if you're a fan of toys, you should know about Toylanta, the biggest toy show in the southeastern United States held annually just north of Atlanta, Georgia. Visit toylanta.com for more information. As always, thanks for watching.